So my name is Nick Harris. I'm actually from Carbondale, Colorado. That's where I grew up. Uh, it's right outside of Aspen, about two hours west of here. And I went to school there my whole life up until college. College I started off at Colorado College, and then I went to school in Maine at College of the Atlantic, which is a really small school. And I really didn't know what to do when I was in school. Wasn't very focused at all at the start. And then I found something to apply my education to, which was beer. I just started getting really into beer, loved it. And I started brewing my own beer. And I thought, you know, I thought that if I could figure out exactly what was happening when you were brewing beer, if you could figure out all the reactions that were taking place, then perhaps you could engineer the best beer in the world, <laughs> right? If you reverse engineered it, like, this is what I want, you know, like this amount of bitterness, this much sweetness, this many esters. And so I took organic chemistry and I paid a lot of attention because it all related. Took organic chemistry too, paid a lot of attention sat in my uh, professor's office for an hour every day talking to him about different reactions. Took biochemistry, same thing. My final project was on the chemistry of brewing. Then I did an independent study on the chemistry of brewing and I broke down every single reaction that took place during the brewing process. From malting to, you know, all the way to the finished product to how it's affecting your body. And then I came out here um, to live for the summer and I was just brewing tons of beer. I got a keg, you know, my parents let me put it in their fridge. It was awesome. Um, and I had this friend, his name's Morgan Williams, and I don't know if you guys know about biochar, but he has a couple of biochar companies. And he and I grew up together. And George Stranahan, who's the owner of Flying Dog, basically helped raise Morgan, like helped put him through school, and was just a real supporter of him. And started this company with Morgan called the Flux Farm and they were doing renewable bioenergy and they're actually partnered with Colorado Mountain College and he kept on saying Nico you know beer is great you know everybody likes beer but you know you need to get into something else you need to move on to butanol this is the stuff and I said oh man what is that you know and, and he was telling me oh it's this alcohol fuel it's a lot better than ethanol it's non-corrosive to your engine and you can just replace gasoline and you make it through fermentation. And I was like, wow, that sounds really cool, but no, I'm really into beer. <laughs> and he just kept on prodding me. He said, hey man, I'm trying to figure out how I can make this stuff from cactus. How would you do that? And I said, well, you'd probably want to break down the carbohydrates, you know, probably use some enzymes. Like in the brewing process, you know, we have barley and there's enzymes that are active that break down these starches into simple sugars and then we feed them to a yeast to produce beer. And so, basically, I kept on reading all these articles on Google Scholar on how to make butanol, and slowly, he convinced me, and then I was hooked. And so, yeah, I still brew beer now, and butanol is, is another passion of mine. Um, yes? Are butyl esters the banana flavors in a typical beer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's uh, isoamyl acetate, I believe is the one. Um, so I, I ended up starting a company of my own, it's called Gourmet Butanol, and it's a consulting company. And then I'm also working at the Colorado Mountain College in Rifle, Colorado, um, which is about three hours west of here. It's, it's in the oil and gas uh, zone of Colorado. So here is our facility at Colorado Mountain College, as it stands right now, where we just got some more money in. Um, and we're going to be sort of redesigning it. Um, Dennis, raise your hand really quickly. This is Dennis, he actually works with me up at the college and um, he's a chemical engineer. And yeah, so we're just sort of putting this together, uh, together, together, and it's um, been a lot of fun. But the way I really got started, other than Morgan prodding me into this, was the, here's the island that I was living on, on Mount Desert Island, Maine. We have about three million visitors to the island every year, and there's about 3,000 tons of food waste produced, which is not that much in the whole scheme of things, but it's quite a bit for a small island. It costs the town about uh, roughly $300,000 to dispose of all that waste, and so what they're doing is they're actually 
driving all this waste off the island about 50 miles to an, incinerator, to an incinerator. They're burning it and then they're, they're generating electricity. But if you do the life cycle analysis, it's really, you know, they're not producing anything. At the same time, there's a lot of fuel that's being trucked onto the island. So during my junior year, three years ago, um, I was taking a class in social entrepreneurship, and it was a year-long class. And our professor, for the first week, said, all right, everybody, get out of this classroom, go into the town, go into the community, and identify some issues, and come up with a solution that you can execute in one year. So I got together with a couple students, and came up with a solution. <laughs> Let's turn yesterday's eggplant parmesan into tomorrow's fuel. So we figured that we could take this feedstock, old food waste, picture that, all eaten up, not so good looking, <laughs> putting it into a uh, fermenter, and through fermentation get out a fuel that can be used in your car, and the byproduct being compost. Um, I don't know if you guys were in that talk earlier in room B, but he's talking about how lipids don't contain nitrogen and phosphorus and ion, you know other metal ions and everything, all the stuff that's good for the soil. Same thing with this, you know, we're just producing a carbon chain with some oxygen and hydrogen on it. So the byproduct is a fertilizer. Um, and so we were trying to close the loop on the island. No fuel on, no food waste off. This is a great idea, sort of. And uh, we did the financials for it and it didn't quite work out very well. But um, we tried. We, we raised about $30,000 from business plan competitions and NASA gave us some money and um, EPA gave us some money and we, we tried to make it work, but uh, we didn't get too far past the, the lab scale. So butanol is what's known as a drop-in fuel. It's kind of like biodiesel. You can put it in your car and drive away. So it replaces gasoline, but you can also use it as heating oil and it can also be mixed with diesel up to 40% and it can also be mixed with biodiesel. And you can also use it in the process of making biodiesel. You can replace methanol with it. So what does it look like? Got my cool pointer here. Here's methanol up here. You got ethanol and here's butanol. So it's a four carbon chain. The difference, the major difference is that both of these are highly polar. Oxygen is a really greedy molecule. It loves electrons. It's electronegative. So it tends to pull electrons towards it out of this orbital. And so this carbon tends to be positively charged, which makes ethanol not an ideal fuel. The same thing happens with ethanol. It's polar, so it bonds with water. It also is corrosive to metals. And butanol doesn't have those properties. It doesn't really mix with water very well. Yes, sir? So is, is it to progressively get better then? Right, yeah, yeah. So if you were to have hexanol, you know, it'd be even less polar. And isopropyl is better than ethanol too, then? Is isopropyl, that, that the this? yeah, isopropyl probably would be better. Hmm. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure. I'd have to look at it again. When this is burned in an engine, I think I'm using this stuff already in a small gas engine, but it came from Germany. Cool. Uh, I don't know what, I, they still won't tell me what this stuff is, but there is absolutely no exhaust fumes as compared to burning gasoline. Exactly. No yeah, because it's oxygenated, you yeah. get a fairly complete reaction. So combustion, the reaction, is carbon dioxide, water, and energy. And that's pretty much what you get when you burn butanol. So they've actually driven a car from Ohio to California, back to Washington, D.C., to Ohio, an unmodified Buick with 100% butanol. This is one butanol, by the way. There's other types of butanol. And they got it tested at all these EPA checkpoints. And some people have a little bit of issue with burning it in their car. And the major issue is that your car isn't picking up the sensor, the emission sensor isn't picking up on all the stuff it's used to picking up, like the oxides of nitrogen. And so it thinks that there's something wrong in the combustion chamber. But really, it's just burning cleaner. That's an easy modification. There's a chip you can buy that overcomes that. It's called a Volo chip. There you go. So buy those chips after you get out of this talk today. Okay. What's it called? Volo. V O L O. Volo. Just yeah. plug it into the into your harness under the dash. Yeah, just tricks tricks your engine, right? Mm -hmm. no. Tricks the computer. Is it to or is it? No, it works on anything. It produces a lot of oxygen in the exhaust. Yeah. I, I work a little bit with fuel additives. Cool. And we've had an issue with we didn't have something. To 
tell a computer more oxygen is okay. Right. Then we more oxygen means you're running too lean. Yep. You gotta have more fuel. Right. So again. Yeah. So it just changes the, the stoichiometric uh, goal. Instead right. of fourteen point seven to one. Yeah, other people also just put resistors in the uh, in the oxygen sensor line. Huh. Yeah. yeah. It makes so. it read less. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. At the at the tank right now, the fuel that has ethanol in it, ethanol only has I think eighty five thousand BTUs per gallon. Yeah, that's not bad. And I think gasoline's like one hundred and thirty thousand BTUs per gallon somewhere in there. One hundred twenty. One hundred twenty. Butanol's at one hundred ten thousand. Yeah. So you're actually decreasing your gas mileage with with ethanol. Butanol, although it's not as energy dense, it's more complete combustion. So it'll actually move you further down the road with less fuel. Uh, does butanol have the high uh, octane too? It doesn't have as high of an octane rating. I think it's it's sort of low grade gasoline, but you can add a little bit of ethanol in there, which has an extremely high octane rating. Yeah. Um, what we can make it from? Anything plant, you know, any plant material. So food waste, fair game, grasses, beetle kill trees, thistle, weeds, landscaping waste, plants. A little lesson on chemistry, are just made out of sugars. There's <laughs> long chains of sugars. So all of these units right here, these are all individual sugar molecules. And that's what a plant is, for the most part. It has some lignin in there, in there as well. Um, there are two types of sugars that make up plants. C5 sugars and C6 sugars. An example of a C6 is glucose. An example of C5 is xylose. Um, this is a big deal because for ethanol, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the typical organism that they use to make it. It can only consume C6 sugars. Okay, So what does that mean? It means that they're limited on the feedstock that they can use. That's why they typically use corn or sugar beets to make it. Our bacteria is a clostridium. It's not the same one that causes tetanus, it's the same one that causes botulism, but it's a different type. They can eat, it can digest C5 and C6 sugars. And that's why something like food waste is viable. But what does this have to do with biodiesel? <laughs> we're at a biodiesel conference. I actually don't know that much about biodiesel. So I'm going to keep this section kind of short, so, uh, just because I didn't want to get drilled too much, just because I, I'm pretty ignorant on the subject. Um, but I do know that it might keep this from happening, um, which is an <laughs> issue I've, I've heard of. Um, so you guys are all probably well aware that uh, to make biodiesel, you typically have a triglyceride. And the way that you do this is that you have an alcohol that you've deprotonated. You've taken off a hydrogen using, um, using a base, which, which is your sodium hydroxide, which creates a negatively charged oxygen. This is uh, your methanol right here. And it will drive into this carbon right here, which is this same thing. And because this carbon is positively charged, because it has a C double bonded to an O, and this oxygen is greedy, remember? So it's pulling these electrons out of the orbital towards it. So this carbon, being positively charged, gladly accepts your oxygen from the methanol, bumps in there, and then this becomes a giant leaving group, um, which is this right here. Boom. This pops off. Your methanol sticks on there. You lose your glycerin and you're stu you've stuck this alcohol onto your chain of triglycerides, and that's what makes an ester. Is that right? I think mostly. so. Yeah. Okay, mostly, cool. You can do the same thing with butanol. Um, butanol, same thing, has the oxygen on it. You can, take off the, you can take off that hydrogen, so it'll jam in there. Um, this R2 that's stuck on here, this is this longer butanol chain. These actually shouldn't be methyl groups right here, this should be another, this should be the R1, but you know, I just found a, a butyl ester photo online. Um, but so picture this being your, your long triglyceride chain, and then you're just sticking on a, a, but, uh, you know, a few more carbons on there. So that's the only difference really. And it's the length of that chain that makes it better in the cold, right? Right, from what I understand. So I found this paper here um, from Bioresource Technology. Um, 
Here's Cloud Point. I think this is something you guys probably talk a little bit about in biodiesel. A um, few different oils here. <coughs> see, this is the, the Cloud Point in degrees Celsius, all these numbers. So here's methyl. This is using methanol, and this is using butanol. So that's creating methyl esters and butyl esters. And you can see that with butanol, you're getting a significant decrease at the uh, cloud point temperature. Um, uh, I was, I, we, we get a lot of canola metal ester, and it's routinely minus six. Routinely yeah. minus six for yeah. cloud point? Yeah. yeah. OK. Could be these guys didn't know what they were doing. I blame it all on them. Well, no, on the next chart, one. we'll look at the next chart. It does show methyl is minus. Well, this is poor point, though. Uh, Slightly different. Um, well, that may, be, may explain it. There, there is a poor point and cloud point are kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I encourage you all to go find your own data. Um, when I was knew that I was going to come present here, this isn't stuff that I'd learned a lot about, but I knew I'd heard it before. Um, please go out, search Google Scholar, and find your own data or try it out. So is that using the butanol as the as a catalyst? Right, instead of methanol. Okay. Yeah, replacing so, methanol so with butanol. The That's really Not the catalyst, the but your alcohol. It's replacing your, your methanol. Right. Right. So yeah, I guess the sodium hydroxide is the catalyst. Right. What, when you're when you're two point two thirty. Yeah, that's uh, that was the probably the next question. I heard sure. a little bit. What is it? Three point two Fahrenheit is negative sixteen Celsius. That's a poor point. They're usually cloud points. I was just doing the delta. Here, I'll go to the cloud delta. point again. Just cloud point. So if we're looking at negative six, then it's twenty one. Twenty one. Yeah. Cool. But it sounds like it might be lower than negative six. Yeah, it, it could be even better, or it could be a little bit worse, I'm not sure. This is sort of why I was trying to keep this part short, just because I knew that <laughs> I didn't know too much about it. <laughs> what percentage, uh, okay, no, never mind. So anyhow, what you're sure. saying is, is that the butanol is good for your rest of the Yeah, it just improves it. And that's that's actually replacing the methanol in the process. Well, let's get him again. Why oh, is Rachel <laughs> minus 15 and canola minus 9? All right. Good job. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, just butanol by itself. That's isobutanol. Um, in butanol or one butanol, which is what we make, it's a melting point is negative 160 degrees Fahrenheit. It's really cold. Somewhere around there, at least. Don't quote me exactly, but it's around that. Um, so yeah, it doesn't have an issue. Isopro uh, isobutanol, I think also t-butanol might have an issue, um, but that's on Wikipedia. It says that it has some cold issues. It's not the same type that we're making. That is what, yeah, that's what Jivo, Jivo is making isobutanol, um, but they use E. coli for their fermentation. So it's, it's just a different, you know, different pathway. Are they suing you? Are they suing us? No way. <laughs> Those butanol guys are always suing each other, I don't know. Yeah. Um, what is it with that? What about cobalt? Cobalt? I'm not sure exactly. I think they're making one butanol. I'm pretty sure. And you said you're making M butanol? Same thing as one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, the main reason, primary, I could be wrong about this, but the primary reason that people don't use butanol in the biodiesel process is it's really expensive. Um, you know, if, if you try to buy it, this is, I went on to Google Shopping. Normally I buy chemicals from Sigma, which is really expensive, but um, just Google Shopping, I found it for $14 uh, per liter, which, Dennis, we should probably buy some of this cheap. How much is methanol? Methanol. How much are you paying for methanol? Uh, $1.68, I think, was our most Yeah, it's down. cheap because they're cracking hydrocarbons. Could you, could you put people call together and maybe have some of yeah. flow? I sure, definitely. And people are doing that actually. There's there is research on that. Different ratios of methanol and butanol. And it yeah, it does. It works with any alcohol. I mean it's it's really simple chemistry, you know, you're just taking off that hydrogen. Yeah. do you all have any issues holding on to water, like ethanol? It doesn't because it's not polar. Yeah. About fifty dollars a gallon, uh, assuming you're buying it in the market. 
Right, yeah, it's it's expensive. Um, so, so this this leads this leads us into the next thing is how do you produce this stuff cheaply? Um, according to these people, sixty percent of your cost of goods sold in making butanol is in acquiring the feedstock. So it's growing your feedstock, it's transporting it because the rest of it is pretty easy. You're just doing a little bit of easy temperature control, a little bit of pH control, and you're throwing bacteria in there. It's an enzymatic process. You know, so it's not it's not too expensive to actually make once you get the feedstock there. And this company was formerly um, it was a uh, butyl fuel, now Green Biologics, and they came out with a report in 2004 that they said that they can make it for 81 cents a gallon if they used whey waste, which is pretty much lactose and minerals. Um, and so that was assuming that they got their feedstock for free. And so that sort of is along the same lines as this, saying that, yeah, the feedstock is really expensive, yeah. Um, I did a study a few years ago on green waste in our, in our county, mm -hmm. and there's a ton of it available that would conceivably be free, but you'd be able to apply a similar dynamic to that, probably, like would sure. it be just as easy to use? What is it, just green? Mostly green waste from like tree cutting and stuff. Yeah, not, definitely. Not compost. Oh, yeah, no problem. No problem. Yard, you mean yard trimming? Yard trimming. Yard trimming. Yeah, yard any, any, yeah. any plant material. There's a, there's, um, a mill in Maine, and they take the hemicellulose, which is the waste product of their mill, their paper mill, and they convert that into butanol to power their helicopters. This is probably a hard question to answer, but do you know how many pounds of food waste makes a gallon of butanol? Mm -hmm. It's a great question, and here's my answer is that it's always changing. Sometimes you have salad, sometimes you have chili. Depends on what's in the, the waste stream. Is there an industry average that even a ballpark is in like a ton or caliber? Because they have all those metrics. Sure. That dry ton of wood. Nobody else is doing this, but I did some back of the envelope calculations and came up with around 60 gallons per ton. Wet ton, basically. It's a wet, wet ton. ton. Yeah. It's a metric ton or a U.S. ton? Uh, it's well, the fact that he's saying wet ton, you didn't even yeah. say how wet it was. It was just an it's about It's ton. about 80% moisture. Okay. <laughs> What's the, like, the best feed stock you can get if you get it? Pure sugar. Sugar so, like, cane. Fruits and stuff like that. Sure, yeah. yeah. Corn, <clears throat> beets. Yeah, that's easy. Definitely. What about meat waste? Meat waste isn't ideal. Um, I'll talk about that in a couple slides. Um, meat does have some nutrients in it, it has amino acids as well as some um, lipids that are good for, for the bacteria to grow. Yeah? I've read that there's a few other kind of co-products and as the bacteria break things down. Um, right. Are you able to separate things out or do you have to distill? Yeah, there's a few ways that you can separate the co-products, co-products being acetone and, ac and ethanol. Um, which are produced in lower concentrations than butanol. Butanol is the primary um, chemical produced. Um, we at Colorado Mountain College are using distillation. Um, it's fairly, fairly simple. It's fairly archaic technology. They've been doing butanol ferment fermentation uh, since the late 1800s using distillation. This technology really got going during the First World War actually in the early 1900s they were trying to make cordite for smokeless gunpowder and acetone is, is what you typically use to make that and so that's why the technology originated so they've been doing it for a long time there were a bunch of facilities way back in the day that commercialized this fermentation process and then they found other ways of making acetone other ways of making cordite so this technology became obsolete is butanol toxic? It is, um, it is toxic, yeah, but it quickly biodegrades, um, especially if it's out in the sun. Um, but it's, it is toxic to marine life, especially. How does it compare to methanol? In terms of toxicity? I don't know, but I would probably rather drink some butanol than methanol, just because methanol will, you know, creates formaldehyde in your body. I think that that would be a terrible death. I don't know. Um, ways that I've thought about uh, decreasing the uh, cost of production. Um, this is a recent grant that I got this past year from the EPA. 
is to create a novel co-culture process for pretreatment of food waste for alcohol fuel synthesis and methanogenesis. And so my idea was to grow fungi on um, food waste, a variety of fungi, um, which were recommended to me by a professor at the University of Georgia with about 40 years of experience. And he suggested, I think it's about five or six species of fungi, um, Pleurotus ostriatus, Pleurotus syringii, Phanerocytes schizophilum, um, a couple other ones. Um, but basically, those, those organisms secrete enzymes and they will degrade organic material. So they'll degrade lignin, they'll degrade hemicellulose, and cellulose. Um, the bacteria can eat amylose and amylopectin, which are the typical starches that we can consume. Um, and so the idea was that this would be a slow process. And so sort of trying to do it quickly, take whatever sugars you produce out of that, ferment that, get butanol, take whatever residual material you have, and feed it through methanogenesis to produce methane gas because if you're trying to speed up the, the whole process, not let these fungi sit here forever, but do it quickly and try to recover some of those enzymes, possibly using ultrafiltration, um, like what you were talking about. But take the undigested material, make methane gas out of that, use that for process heat and electricity, and then that would help power the whole process. And so that's something that I'm still investigating. So how that sort of works is that fungi, they're secreting these enzymes. This is all the um, carbohydrate material and lignin is the glue that's holding that all together. So fungi will treat that material. They wrap their mycelium around there, freeze up everything, and that's um, how we can get out those carbohydrates. I found this in the parking lot. This is um, a piece of wood with some pleurotus on it, white rock fungus, oyster mushroom. To the, uh, to the extent that heat would speed this process, does it speed the mycelia running or what's the... To a certain point, you'd, you'd want to target their optimal growth conditions, you know, okay. so you wouldn't want it to get too hot. I think that um, oyster mushrooms grow well at around, you know, no more than 80 degrees Fahrenheit, I believe. 68 to yeah. yeah, it's not what, too what hot. What about eating the mushrooms that you grow? <laughs> this, so actually, that's a good question is can you eat them? Maybe, but it's a different, this, um, this pleurotus is different than the one that you find in the grocery store. So this oyster mushroom is not the same. It's the same species, but this one has basically adapted to degrade woody material, organic material. So it comes from the forest where trees are decomposing. The trees are decomposing because there's fungi and bacteria that are secreting enzymes to break down that organic material. The oyster mushrooms in the store have been selected, bred, to, for flavor. You know, they're, they're big producers that, with their fruiting bodies. Um, they taste good. These ones would probably be slow to produce and might be, not, might taste? not taste as good. Yeah. Um, what kind of time frame would it be to break that down? Do um, to do it fully out? I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, um, sure. I imagine it would take a couple of weeks to fully degrade it. Um, you do that in something like a fermenter? Sure, yeah. Pack the spores and the, yep. and the wood chips together? Yep, exactly. And then when the spores have finished reacting with the wood chips, what do you have? You'd have sugars. Does it look like sugars or does it look like sawdust? You would, you would have a liquid portion and a solid portion. And so the solid portion is what you could further treat with methanogenesis. And the liquid portion would theoretically be the C5 and C6 sugars and some liquid enzymes. And so that's what you would feed into the butanol stream. Now is, is it wet wood that you put in the fermenter with the spores? Correct. So you have... It, this would be a liquid culture. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a liquid culture. So it'd be like a soup in the fermenter. It'd be a big soup. Stew. Broth. Be a soupy broth stew. <laughs> does methanogenesis take place throughout the process, or it does not? That's a separate bacteria that does that. Okay. Yeah. So here's a trivia question: What sure. happened before you had the mycelia? You use so if, if you weren't using fungi to do this, the typical process is you <coughs> use some sort of pretreatment to break down the lignin. <coughs> which can either happen with high temperature, high pressure, not as high a temperature and pressure as what you guys deal with. 
you know, I always thought our process dealt with high temperatures and pressures, but I'm talking like, you know, 200 degrees Fahrenheit, not, not too hot. I've been talking to people here telling me about 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Where's that guy from? Uh, That's super critical. No, there's some other guy who's making, uh, he's making some sort of oil, Camelina oil. No, it's not 600. Yeah, he has a reactor that he's trying to get up to 585 degrees Is Fahrenheit. Is that for direct conversion? I think it's a Mercalian reactor system. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah so that's yeah, hot. But, but most conventional bodies is not that. Right, okay. So um, anyways, you typically degrade the lignin, break it apart with either acid pretreatment or using a base. Um, at CMC, we're probably going to be using um, sodium hydroxide at near room temperature around 45 degrees Celsius. Sorry to keep on switching these units on you guys, but. Um, so then the rest of the process is kind of like brewing, sort of what I was alluding to before, where you just have sugars, you feed it to a bacteria, and they produce um, the molecules that you're going for. Somebody had asked about meat in there. This is a new vision I have. I just thought of this other night. I don't know if it's a good idea, but it could be a good educational. Um, experience for students to try out, which is if you have all this stuff, you have burgers, you have all your food waste, take the fats out to make biodiesel, produce butanol with all the carbohydrates, take the undigested material and make methane, and then your byproducts are compost and fertilizer, so you still have all these nutrients that can be returned to the soil. I don't know, I think it's kind of a cool idea, but uh, might not when be When you easy. say undigested, it's basically things that, that didn't break down into sugars. So it's using the fungal process is what I'm thinking of, where we would try to do it quickly, and we wouldn't get full conversion of carbohydrates into sugars. You can certainly use, most people, oh, I forgot this part of the product. What I meant to say after the lignin pretreatment is to people typically use purified enzymes from Novozymes to break down the carbohydrates. And so the fungi are replacing the pretreatment and the uh, purified enzymes. So yeah, with fungi, you would have undigested material. Um, I think that there probably wouldn't be that much of a shortage of feedstock, especially in a ski resort town. Um, we get a lot of visitors to these mountains. Um, they produce a lot of waste. Um, I used to go visit a composting facility in the Roaring Fork Valley outside of Aspen. There's a lot of food waste, a lot of landscaping waste. Um, there's no shortage of waste there. Let me, let me ask, I mean, yeah. this whole emerging industry of compost, do they actually need certain amounts of the different components to make the right mix? The yeah, but food waste tends to not be that helpful for them. Um, you, want you, you, want, you want woody material as well. You want things that will suck up a lot of the moisture. Food waste is really high in water. Okay. So I was at this composting facility in Safeway. I drove from Grand Junction and dropped off a couple truckloads of melons and tomatoes and all this stuff that's full of water. I don't care about water because I'm going to add it to the process anyways. Okay. And this composting guy, his name's Jim Duke, he's a good friend of mine. He said, ah, man, I take this stuff because I can't stand to see it go into the landfill. I hate food waste, is what he said. He said, you see all that mulch and you see all those wood chips over there? Do you know how much of that stuff I'm going to have to put in here to dry up all this water? You know, it's not a competition with them. I wonder because, like in Austin, there's a growing compost movement. Yeah. And they're starting commercial composting. And it's going to be um, a law in the next couple of years. Yep. And uh, they're trying to figure out how to do it. And, you know, this biodiesel guy, I'm talking to all these restaurants about their waste, and I'm seeing nobody's using composting yet. Yeah. And, uh, seems like an opportunity to work with the compost companies because they're going and turning it into, into landfill. I mean, sorry, compost. Yep. Um, I just wonder what opportunities people like have. There's a opportunity for a higher uh, value. Yeah. Much value. I mean, we've had at Piedmont, I know that plenty of the restaurants have called and, and said, you know, hey, you know, what's the space? Is it picking up anymore? Are you guys taking food waste yet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was actually just living in Austin and I met with the, brewer, the head uh, brewer at 512. 512 Brewing Company, and he uh, he said, man, I have all this barley waste, and right now I just feed it to pigs, and I hate that. He's like, I would love to make some biofuel out of this stuff. 
And so I actually went there to apply for a job originally, and he forgot that I was even applying for a job. He got so excited about this idea. Um, but yeah, Austin, you know, they're, they're doing it. New York, San Francisco, these are all big cities that are beginning to mandate that restaurants and other businesses compost, at least separate their organics. In San Francisco, they even give residential folks little yeah. containers for their recycling and they pick it up. Yeah. I mean, for their composting. Yeah, there's residential composting in Boulder. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, there's is a there lot potential of for maybe uh, a integrated meal with worm composting or no? With worm composting? Yeah, yeah. You know, with worm composting, you know, if you were to do that short process that I was talking about with the fungi and you had un undigested material, hey, you could either make methane gas out of that or, sure, take some of that and do worm composting. I don't see why not. From a, from a business standpoint, one of the things that's interesting with compost, it tends to be a winner-take-all type of situation. We saw that in Seattle with yeah. a single compost company. Right, getting, Seattle too. All of it. Yeah. So you've got to know who you're, who you're going to partner with. Right. Because they'll get everything. Or get in there early enough before there's yeah. other composting companies. Yeah. Um, the original idea of Gourmet Butanol was that we could provide a service for big municipalities and businesses. Um, and so it was more that they would contract us to handle their waste and that way they would work with us to produce it even if it didn't make complete financial sense. Um, and I was actually contacted by a state in Mexico last year and they said, can you please come down here and deal with all of our waste for us? A hundred emails later they said, well, we actually don't have any money, but we'll give you the land and we'll give you all of our waste. And I said, wow, that sounds great. Um, maybe later. Some other day. Kickstarter. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to tell you guys a little bit about what we're doing in Rifle. Is that we've built this facility over the past couple of years. Um, and it's just a great opportunity for students to get out there and try out a new process. These are all, I think, fourth graders possibly. This is Dennis right there and behind you guys. And, um, yeah, so we have, we have kids of all ages, but it is a college out there and the kids that we have going to school, they're, most of them are going into process technology, so they're going out to work on oil and gas rigs. And this is just a way of teaching them another type of technology and hopefully we can steal some of them away before they go to the dark side. Um, but we're also doing solar out there. And um, it's beyond just running this process. Well, so we have a lot of cool equipment out there right now. Um, but we also have some awesome analytical equipment. Um, we have a gas chromatograph. We have a high performance liquid chromatograph. We have a cell culturing uh, anaerobic chamber. We have a shaker flask. We have a bunch of cool stuff there. Yeah. <laughs> and when I was in college, you know, man, I would have loved to use this equipment. And this is a community college. And we have, you know, any, a lot of students who are getting their associate's degree even can hop on a high performance liquid chromatograph and analyze for sugars and monitor fermentation and help us out in the yard and do welding. And I think it's pretty incredible, especially for a community college. Um, we're also partnered with some really cool people. Um, a couple years ago, we tried to go for a grant we being Colorado Mountain College, we tried to go for a grant for $5.2 million with some really, um, some of the best scientists in the world. We were working with uh, the Joint Bioenergy Institute. We were working with uh, Cal Berkeley, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, UC Davis, Logos Technologies. Uh, Colorado State University is growing grass for us to try out, growing grass on marginal land with little to no inputs. Um, the town of Rifle wants to use this butanol in their municipal vehicles. So there's this big synergy, and we're just this small college out there, but we're attracting a lot of attention. And I don't know if you guys know Harry Beller, but he's into this idea that we just have top scientists who just actually think that this is cool, which is surprising. But what they want to do is they want to retrofit our facility, and they want to try other technology. Like, um, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory wanted to take our byproducts and turn them into other high value chemicals. You know? And so I see this as an opportunity to work with other industries, other industry partners, and have them install new technology. We can be a second NREL you know, at this small community college. And I think it could happen. You know, we're on our way. 
Um, so anyways, that's, that's my vision. I just think it's really cool that we can have students um, involved and that they can be out there and they can help us work on these far out ideas that might not make any sense to any in industry person, but you know, idea where you take all the food waste from a, from a ski resort and you convert it into three different types of fuel, get one that can be plugged into a diesel engine, one that can replace gasoline, and then uh, a gas, uh, methane, that can be used on your stove or in a compressed natural gas vehicle. Yeah? Uh, I just wanted to mention, uh, sure. being biodiesel, there's not really oil in, in food waste. There's not enough to speak of. Sure. Um, the food waste that we use is the, is the used cooking oil. So, I mean, it, it sounds nice, but realistically, there's not really a way, at least that I'm aware of, to get any appreciable quantity of lipids from food waste. Right, because you're thinking of only making biodiesel. Yeah, that's what I mean. You're, you're right, so if you, if you did the triple point, though, where you're making a few other products, then it might be worth it, just because I've been hearing at this conference that corn ethanol um, facilities are giving biodiesel um, facilities their oil. Is that not right? So mm -hmm. they're getting dual well, usage. It's a byproduct of the ethanol production process. Right. That so, so it's an oil. And it's a special kind of oil. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah, the same, exactly. same, yeah, same thing. It. It's the same thing. Yeah. There's lipids yeah. in all of this material. Yeah. If you were just trying to make biodiesel from it, man, that sounds like a rough time. It's going to be tough. But if you're trying to get full utilization, produce three different fuel sources, and your byproduct is compost or fertilizer, hey, it may work. Mm -hmm. Whether it's going to make financial sense, I don't know. Whether it's a good project for students, hey, maybe it might be. Is it a good service for the town with subsidies? That might work as well. I don't know. It's something to be investigated. Do you have the process posted anywhere? Do I have my process yeah. posted? No. <laughs> um, I, uh, I mean, we, we have our process posted in our own. Um, Computers, you know, I don't, well, I don't have anything that's available for most people. Okay. But I could, I could run it, run through it with you if you wanted to. Sure. How much uh, is that little plant that your your pictures? How much does that produce? And uh, what what is the cost per gallon that you're, you're able to produce it for? We're not exactly sure yet. We just um, put in a request for a proposal for two, um, four hundred gallon fermenters. Um, I think that we'll probably be able to get out about 15 gallons per week. About 3% of the volume is going to be butanol, roughly, give or take a few um, percentage points. But um, I'm not sure. It's not going to be economically feasible at this scale. But like I said, there's other value that we're creating. So what market can you sell the butanol into, you know, at any kind of, kind of small scale? Does that have to be a, a standard to be called butanol? I mean, like, could you produce sure. that and whatever comes out of your flask, you sell the Kumar and make it biodiesel? Or is it more like it's going to have to be sold into a market that has a standard and COAs and all that kind of stuff? Sure. So. I'm sure that there would have to be some sort of standard, but I'm not positive about that. Can I answer one other question? Yes, sir. The reason why I started using this stuff, unknown to me that it is cool. actually butanol, yeah. was that um, the uh, gas engines, small gas engines, whether they're powering lawnmowers or blowers or trimmers or what have you, with this uh, new blend of gasoline with lots of ethanol in it, it is corroding the rubber systems in there. These, the service departments of these, of these different shops uh, are just going nuts just trying to re redo these things. Right. When you use butanol in this stuff, instead of, ethanol? instead of the ethanol based stuff, it is just gorgeous stuff and there is no smell. So, how do you get, I mean, usually you came to buy gas without ethanol anymore? Well, believe it or not, I, I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, and these guys are basically bringing in 45 gallon drums from Germany wow. and through a distributor, and they are breaking down into like uh, gallon containers and they're selling that in their shops. And as a direct, uh, a direct Competitor to gasoline, and the guys once they use it, they won't go back. Even though there's a premium to this stuff. Using straight butanol and no using, gasoline. Yes. Okay. I see. Using straight butanol. And, and they're not selling it for like three times the price of gasoline. Yeah. What are they selling it for? Oh, gosh, I can't remember. I just I was buying small things, just yeah. playing around with it. So, but I was just blown away by this stuff. It's well, like in Canada, fuel costs a little bit more than here anyway, right? Yeah, we got all these other taxes and what have you, but. Guys, you can make it yourself. I mean, yeah, geez. selling it on the solvent market, you can make more money. I think it's six or seven dollars a gallon. Mm. But Does the it have any purity. Effect on those seals or 
I mean, does it swell them or anything? Not, not, they're just, this is the first year that they've introduced it, and they're just looking at really good, really good results. Like, guys who bought, like, this one liter container, yeah. you know, going back for the gallons, and the guys, it's like the guys who got the classic cars, the antique cars, they're moving to this stuff mm -hmm. because they can't get up to date seals for these methanol things, and they're going all just additives and BS and stuff. And this has got some potential. Cool. I'm gonna go boom, boom, boom. Cool. So my question is uh, about the, the the beer out of the original fermentation for butanol. What's the concentration of butanol that you're getting? Three around three percent if you do a batch process. And, um, oh, wait, you're talking about beer or for this process? For uh, butanol, what's yes. the concentration of? Yeah, about three, about three percent. And in, in, Be when in people do ethanol fermentation, they get around twenty percent. Yeah, ten. Okay, twenty. But you can do continuous. The reason that it's only three percent is because butanol is toxic to the bacteria that produces it, and so if you can withdraw the butanol as it's produced, which is technology that exists, and then add in nutrients as your withdrawing product, you can keep it in steady state which means that you can optimize the system. You can target exact parameters to maximize the production of butanol. I'm going to go here and then here. Uh, <clears throat> and then you. I'm wondering, uh, I assume you probably have it, but has anybody here experimented with making meth uh, biodiesel using butanol as a feedstock? And, you know, I'm using iron on the weight off the welds. Is ease or difficulty of doing that? You're saying, you know, the typical technique. I'm using butyric acid. Butyric acid? Instead, it's like it's a fatty acid. Sure. Which is really smelly stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, I think Brandon, yeah. Brown yeah. <laughs> I think Brandon said he's used higher, higher molecular weight alcohols. It's a similar process. You're just, you know, stripping off a of hydrogen so that it will bond to the triglyceride. Well, methanol is the most reactive. Yeah, I understand that, but I mean, like, you know, there's a reason why, you know, ethanol is difficult to work with, too. I mean, the, you know, for. You know, I was just wondering, because I always thought that, you know, the kinetics of basically the aggressiveness of that, you know, meth oxide or eth oxide gets lower the longer the carbon chain, so the longer the R group is. Sure. And yeah. so it doesn't compete with water as well, you know, I, or hydroxide. Yeah. So I was just wondering if anybody has any experience with that. I could see it taking longer. That's what I would guess. It would just take longer. But I don't know for sure. Yeah, the conversion. Yeah. Goes down. Sure. A little bit. So you yeah. kind of more extreme operating conditions with reaction. Balance it out. I don't know if this is true, but maybe you wouldn't need to worry so much about getting all the butanol out. How is maybe butanol made good. today? <clears throat> How's it made today? Yeah. yeah. Cracking hydrocarbons. Yeah. yeah. Is it possible to make methanol in <coughs> some other fashion than using uh, petroleum chemicals? I know of one way, which is to use a catalyst to convert methane into into methanol mm -hmm. um, but I don't I was just researching this yesterday because I've heard a lot of people talk about using a lot of methanol and I said man if I could figure out how to produce this stuff on site then that'd be sweet. <laughs> Woody. So uh, there's a company in Asheville called uh, Danny's Dumpsters and he's collecting a lot of food waste now and composting it and he was asking me if I could help him turn it into fuel. Cool. He said no. Uh, but would you be willing to talk to them, consult with them? Are, is it at that stage yet? Are you ready to maybe <coughs> work with some other people who have feedstock and want to get into something like this? Sure, definitely. Yeah. So I just remembered the name of the company I was trying to tell you earlier. It's cool. Mother Earth Innovations. Mother Earth Innovations. I don't know if they still exist, but they were doing similar stuff. Cool, awesome. And then the, that. the question I have is, um, you were talking about continuous versus batch. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could do kind of a modified version of both, like a two-stage batch. batch process. Yeah, one where you're putting new stuff in the batch and taking old stuff out. Yeah. Um, it wouldn't be too dissimilar from some of the stuff we're doing. It's pretty easy to do. That's sort of the way I envision our process running is fed batch and what we'll actually do we're just trying to use two tanks and now just because we can't really afford more than that but we'll have one tank that's um one tank that's full right here so this level's here and this will be completely ready to go into this tank so it's sparged with nitrogen um, so it's completely anoxic nutrients prime everything's prime ph is awesome fill this up a little bit, inoculate it with our bacteria, let that ferment out a little bit, so this net level's down here now, increase the volume a little bit more, step it up, increase it a little bit more, 
Exactly, same sort of thing. And you could you could withdraw some as well to process. And does that do you create a, a, a view of null float or what what do you track and process at that point? That'd be a great idea. <laughs> you can use what they typically use is um, different membranes. Okay. So there's actually porous and non porous membranes, which sounds pretty crazy, but uh, silicolite is a non-porous membrane, but it's selective to butanol. Another way that you can do it is you can you can charge. So basically, during this process, you get out CO2 and hydrogen gas, and you can actually return these to the bottom here, yep. sparse them back through, and it will carry out a lot of the volatiles, including butanol. That's low cost. So that's a way to decrease um, the concentration of butanol so that the bacteria will stay alive. Yeah, but the condenser at the end of it, right? And it doesn't need a lot of heat to vaporize. Not if you're sparging it with the gas, because you're decreasing the pressure of the system. Okay. How warm is that system? About 35 degrees uh, Celsius. And what temperature does the butanol condense? What temperature does it condense? Yeah. Uh, negative 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So. So you're running... Uh, or some, or sorry, sorry, I was talking about the melting point. Um, what temperature is it condensed at? I mean, you've at? got 35 it's degree no longer, gases coming it's, through there. It's no longer... So butanol is in its azeotrope at around, I think it's 98 degrees Celsius, somewhere in there. It's, it's below the boiling point of water. So that's when it would be in its gas phase or a liquid phase. Is that where you're wondering? I thought you just said that was a 35 degree... Uh, right, but you're asking, you're, you're asking you're pumping air, pumping gases through. You were wondering when it would condense, and so well, I'm just wondering what your what your condenser temperature has to be. To would it need to be that cold because it would condense anywhere below whatever below 35 degrees? Well, it'd be below the 98 degrees, whatever the vapor phase is. The reason that it's going out of this system is because you're creating little pockets of of atmosphere, pretty much. That's you're bubbling it bubbling gases through there and you're providing a surface for the butanol and other volatiles to go out of solution, things boil because their pressure equals the pressure of the surrounding system. And so you're providing small concentrated pockets where it is able to go into its vapor phase. And then as soon as it gets out of here, if you just ran tap water in a so column, it, ju it just it tags condense. onto the other molecules that are right. gas use already. It's really easy to make. I've actually made a benchtop gas stripper before. It worked very easily. I wasn't doing any super cooling or anything. It's really easy to run. It gets up top. You have a little condenser. Tap water, cold water, doesn't really matter. It condenses out. What, was the, what would be the purity of that butanol? It wouldn't be that pure. You'd have other solvents in there as well. You'd have other things that are volatilizing. So you'd have some of the acetone, some of the ethanol. Um, but at least you've gotten it out of this system where it's posing an issue to the bacteria. Do you wash it with water to get rid of that? Uh, no, I mean, we've, we're planning on using distillation to separate those two. When you say acetone and ethanol are the side products, mm -hmm. what are the ratios? Acetone, acetone, ethanol, butanol. I can't pull that off the top of my head, but um, I think that, so butanol is around 20 grams per liter, and then the other ones are, it's about half the concentration of the butanol, so oh. we're in there. Yeah, it's not quite as much. That sounded like a distillation joke when you said you can't pull that off the top of your head. Uh, That's what I was going for. <laughs> <laughs> I was seeing if you guys were witty enough to follow me. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions? No, I'm just... <laughs> Could you sum all that up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Anything yeah, else, yeah, guys? Cool. Looks like... Uh, so you said you use enzymes to create...